So welcome all. Um, so today we're going to be discussing what policy for UK social care data needs to know. Uh, we've got a great panel and I'm really, really pleased with Sean O'Donovan from UCL, the UK Pandemics Acceleration Center for organizing and convening today's webinar. We have a fantastic panel and I'll just briefly introduce you to the next uh, event we have planned. Uh, which is going to be on the 6th of December. This will be a little bit different. So we'll be uh, launching um, a new thing, uh, um, an, what we call an international living report on COVID and long-term care systems, which is a bit of a collection of everything we've been learning uh, from the experience of different countries of dealing with COVID in long-term care systems. It's going to be a mini online conference and I'm going to be sharing some information on this on the chat. So that's all from me, and uh, I'm going to give the floor to Sharon and the panel, uh, and welcome everyone. Um, just to say, this webinar is going to be recorded. If you're not speaking, please unmute yourself. You can keep the camera on or not, according to your preference, but if you ask a question, we, we'd love to see you. So thank you very much, and uh, all yours, Sharon. Adelina, thanks a lot. So. I, I want to give a, a quick overview of, of what we're going to do over the next 85, 90 minutes or so. Introduce uh, the, the really great panel we've got here um, and maybe put this, put the event into the into context of, of where we are now in terms of social care, in terms of data policy um, and in terms of maybe the pandemic uh, in general. So. I, I'm a social science researcher at UCL. I work on the UK Pandemic Ethics Accelerator, which was a rapid response uh, project uh, funded by UKRI. Uh, we've been going about nine or 10 months now. Um, and along with colleagues at UCL, Melanie Smallman and James Wilson, we've been working on, I guess, the ethical and policy challenging challenges uh, arising during the pandemic regarding large scale data collection, data use, data access by governments, by large corporations, and across various parts of society, including social care. And increasingly, we're concerned with the long tail of the pandemic, this both kind of recovery, the maybe ending, maybe normalization of various aspects of, of, of the pandemic and the role existing and proposed data infrastructures have to play in all of this. Um, so today we're working with Adelina, we're working with the LTC COVID team to look at what next for social care data and the policies and the politics uh, that support that or don't. Um, and the focus today is going to be on, on the UK, right across the UK. And, and I think what we'd love to do is maybe come back in a few months and, and add a global perspective uh, to that. And, and I know that's a part of what the, um, what the observatory does here. So there's three overlapping kind of pieces of context I wanted to, 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 to cover just before I introduce the, the panel um, in terms of why now. And, and I guess the first is the context of social care is shifting uh, in the UK, perhaps globally. Uh, we've seen the, the health and social care levy uh, being announced, details maybe starting to emerge slowly on that. There's a white paper in the offing. So practitioners and researchers and think tanks uh, are really trying to get to grips with this, right? So what does that mean for data? And I guess the second part piece of context that we want to kind of undergird today's dis discussion is maybe data use and data policy is shifting more generally, both within health and social care uh, and outside of that. Uh, and we've seen the data saves lives policy, uh, kind of provisional policy over the summer, um, where maybe the the, the department has looked to lock in the gains of uh, the pandemic data strategies. Um, we've seen maybe a review from Ben Goldacre and people like that. And, and we've also seen, you know, some, some new and experimental data emerging. Uh, last week, the ONS put out um, data on self-funding, folks who self-funding their own adult social care for, for the first time. So that landscape is shifting. And I think the third piece that's really interesting for us at the, at the Ethics Accelerator is the broad societal context in which individuals and communities trust public data and how maybe some of that trust is shifting. And we, and we saw at the start of the summer, 
the huge opt-out controversy uh, where, where more than a million people opt-outed are sharing their GP data in the UK. So what does that mean for, for those of us working in social care, working on social care data infrastructures? Um, and how do we start to make sense of some of this? And that's really what we want to, want to get at today. Uh, and I guess we're interested to hear from the panelists. We're really interested to hear from, from what I hope will be a, a, a discursive conversation in, involving all the audience. How maybe we, we um, who maybe we lobby, where we lobby, how we achieve political kind of consensus or dissensus, what kind of insider politics or wider movement building is needed uh, for all of this. So that's the background. Um, to discuss this, we've got a really big panel. We've got seven people usually, and it's been my experience over the course of the pandemic, and doing these kind of seminars is that we've got a couple of people drop out last minute. You've got to, you, you've really got to make sure you've got lots of people on board. Um, this today's event really has nobody's stepped back. Everybody's cleared their diaries. People have suggested more people. So it, it, it really is certainly for me an exciting event and I hope it's, I hope it's useful for, for the folks in the audience too. So we've got seven panelists. I've asked them to, um, to, to help set the context by kind of talking maybe for four minutes each um, about um, how, you know, how they, in terms of the work they do, how they uh, use data to define, deliver, measure uh, better care, and what needs to be done specifically, what needs to be put on a policy agenda in the coming months to achieve uh, that from both their perspective and uh, and the wider sector. Um, so I'll introduce people as we go. The, our first panelist is going to be Jenny Burton from the University of Glasgow, who give us, I hope, a, a, a clinician a type of perspective on some of this. Jenny, welcome. Thanks, Kian, and thanks for the opportunity to be part of the panel today and uh, representing Scotland. Um, as is always useful in discussions about social care, I think, and particularly around data to give a, a broad perspective on things. So um, I came into the kind of care home data space as an enthusiastic PhD student geriatrician back in 2015, because I wanted to answer the question about people who come into hospital and then move into care homes um, and to understand their experiences and their journeys. And at the time, um, everyone was very excited about data linkage. And so therefore, this was going to be really, really easy to do. Um, and rapidly, I discovered that the population living in care homes are, in fact, invisible in a lot of our national data sources, and particularly in health data sources. And so actually answering a simple question like who comes into hospital from a care home and who goes out from hospital newly into a care home are exceptionally challenging questions. Um, and these are important because underpinning sort of these questions are experiences from practice, how we organize our care and our services, and for, for NHS staff, how we benchmark that our services are supporting people adequately. Um, and so when we can't answer sort of very fundamental questions like that, it, it starts to create issues in terms of our understanding. But more than that, I discovered really that this was a sign that actually the people who live in care homes are invisible in, in many ways at a sort of national data perspective. Um, and that a lot of that has come from there being sort of siloed systems of data. And despite there being big efforts to collect data at local levels, data co to collect um, information from funders and those who pay for care, trying to join these pieces of the jigsaw together is remarkably difficult and has been, I guess, the afterthought of the data linkage revolution, particularly in the NHS. But more than that, people think that this will be quite straightforward. You just sort of bring in some social care data, link it nicely to your health data and, and spit out an answer. And the reality is the challenges that underpin the, well, how are we going to go and work out what these things mean um, and what they mean to the people who've collected them? Because one of the big things about reusing data is it wasn't collected for researchers to go about or clinicians to go about evaluating services. It's collected primarily often to assess those who need social care, but it has a very different purpose and therefore often a very different embedded meaning. 
kind of people need to realise that they need to spend time understanding what it means um, before just kind of joining everything together. So all of that was the, the kind of pre-pandemic context. Um, then we came into COVID and all the questions about understanding those living in care homes in particular, my particular area of interest came to the fore. Um, and I went back and found emails that date back to the beginning of April of last year, where I said, I'd really like to get hold of some of this data so that we can understand care home outbreaks, but understand them from the, the bottom up rather than the, the top down. Of course, what's happened instead is that the outbreak data and analysis has very much come from the NHS focus and the work was able to be done in Scotland by looking at the question of hospital data rather than starting off with the question of how we best support and understand things from a care home level. So moving forward, we clearly recognise that we need to understand a lot about care homes and a lot about social care if we want to talk about data. So things like the fact that care homes are people's homes, um, they aren't hospitals, they aren't clinical resources, they aren't places for people to be moved when other services are busy, is really, really key. The fact that care homes are changing in their role, and so increasingly it is possible to only be a care home resident for a short period of time, our data systems have absolutely no way of, of grappling with that particular challenge, even though it's very known to the people using the services. There are so many other questions and examples like that in terms of how we want to understand our data better. But perhaps the most fundamental is recognising that the most valuable data about social care users comes from within the sector and the services themselves, where they are data rich and intelligence rich. But the issue is about other people being able to access, understand and use that information. And that requires a collaboration but it requires a collaboration that says what's important to how we look after people in care homes as our primary question, and that being the focus of efforts and resource as opposed to what things do other people want to count and how can we add additional questions into the new data tools that we've created, because we have to recognise that every moment spent entering data into a system is spent not delivering frontline care to an individual in their home. And that's really, really important. However, I'm passionate that we can make this better, that we can work together and we can uh, work from the bottom up about what's needed as opposed to from other stakeholder perspectives. But I also recognise that in terms of uh, the, the key question of Keynes about what needs to happen now, we do also need a period of reflection and, and recognition that the system, all of the system is under tremendous pressure. And this is not a time to bring in quick solutions that are geared towards specific pandemic related answers that we need to learn and reflect on where we've come from. Um, and that's a piece of work that for Scotland we're undertaking to say, right, where, where have we come into this? What have we developed and progressed in the last 18 months? And what do we need collaboratively to build together so that we have better and more useful social care data but that we recognise that that's going to take time. And as winter hit in Scotland in August, now is not the right time to introduce sort of rapid changes to the system because we need the people from the bottom up to be able to work together to tell us what's needed. And that's where we need to start from. Great stuff. Thanks, Jenny. I'm going to go through the panel first, and then we'll, we'll open up for a, a series of, of questions. But if you do have questions, particularly clarification questions, um, please do feel free to, to enter them into the chat as we as we go through our uh, initial uh, round. OK, Owen Davies from Social Care Wales. Thanks, Shane. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks for inviting me. Uh, my name's Owen Davies. I'm the Data and Intelligence Manager at Social Care Wales. Uh, like Jenny from uh, another devolved administration where things are slightly different from um, Scotland and in England. Uh, Social Care Wales is a Welsh Government sponsored body set up in 2017, part of the Regulation and Inspection of Social Care Act. It's got three primary objectives. It acts as the workforce regulator and workforce developer for social care in Wales. Uh, works to improve public confidence in social care and the bit that I'm probably most involved in is its remit to improve care and support in Wales. Um, I've not been in post long, I've been here since the start of September. Um, I've probably come from Welsh Government, I was a policy wonk in Welsh Government 
I, um, as my team developed a new performance improvement framework for social services in the last few years. Um, and prior to that, um, I got a background in, in um, analysis and, and data anyway, um, working in local government as well. Um, but I guess like pretty much everyone else here, um, I've had a lot to do with supporting the response to the pandemic over the course of the last 18 or so months. And what that pandemic has done is shone a light on data and often the inadequacies of data during this time. So um, part of my role in Social Care Wales, I've inherited quite a few exciting projects from my predecessor, probably the most significant of which is leading on the development of the data strategy for social care in Wales. This is something that um, predates the pandemic, but actually was accelerated really um, uh, by what's happened over the last um, 18 months or so. We've worked closely with colleagues from Welsh Government, um, health services and uh, having some support from KPMG um, and whilst uh, we're far from done some of the work that we've done during this discovery phase of uh, the program has highlighted some of the key challenges that we face as a sector in using our data to deliver better care. Um, what are they? Uh, I suspect they're not any different from those elsewhere and from other kind of events and um, Fora that I've uh, been on in the last few months, you know, the, the evidence I've seen is that they, they are very, very similar. I'll rattle through some of the, the, the main themes at least. So um, data skills, or actually the lack of data skills is um, hugely problematic. There's a, a quite a large variation in capability and capacity to work with data in social care across Wales. Um, and indeed, data science is a, an alien concept to most of social care outside the world of uh, academia. If we want to use our data effectively, we need these skills. Um, data sharing, another big problem. The pandemic's allowed much more agile sharing of data, um, but, you know, we've not solved it. And in fact, when we look at data sharing, we, we use um, something called SAIL in Wales quite often, which is our big um, ESA uh, linked data repository uh, hosted by Swansea University. The biggest issue in getting data into sale isn't technical, it's cultural. It's to do with overcoming the legal and administrative hurdles of information governance. I'm not saying that the IG stuff should be ignored, far from it, but um, there must be a better way of doing these things. Um, data standards data models, interoperability, call it what you will. Um, when we were doing some of the discovery work for data strategy, this was the number one area cited by our stakeholders. They want to be sure that the data they're using is compatible with each other. They're not comparing apples to oranges or indeed, you know, apples to Ford Fiestas, as it seems like they're doing in a, a lot of instances. And then value is another big one uh, cited by stakeholders. We were told that organisations and supply tons of data for many, many, many different things, but get very little in return. It goes into this black hole that sucks lots of data in and gives nothing back to them. Um, and they're saying, why is we? Why should we as organizations? Um, we haven't got a huge amount of resource um, to spare when it comes to you know understanding our own data. Why should we use all of that capacity up in providing you something? Um, that we get nothing back from. So that was um, a really interesting thing. And finally, probably most importantly for me, the pandemic's given us an opportunity, and it's an opportunity to really up our game in using data and evidence more effectively. But we've got to remember that somewhere in all of this are people, the people receiving the social services, the families, the professionals gathering the information. Uh, we can't lose sight of those people or lose sight of what it is we're trying to do, why we want to do this. We're doing this in order to provide better services, to provide better working conditions uh, uh, and processes for, for the staff who deliver the services, to make sure that you know the um, connections between different organisations are uh, better served so that you know this notion of a seamless service um, exists between health and care. You know, I can tell you that if you ask somebody, 
they don't care who provides that service. All they want is a good service. You know, it's up to us to figure out some of those problems. Um, and also, interestingly, when you talk to people about the use of data, particularly in terms of health data, they see the NHS as the NHS, not an umbrella organisation with 70 different services inside that, all of whom struggle to share information with each other. So um, engaging with these people, engaging with people, as we've seen with the, the GDP, GDP, GPDPI, I'll get that right in a minute, um, fiasco over the last uh, couple of months has um, shown they're critical to, to, to the, um, our solving of this puzzle and we should omit them at our peril. So that's me, excited to be here today, really excited to hear people's thoughts on moving forward. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, and then thanks for being here. Let's go to Liz Jones from the National Care Forum uh, next. Liz, welcome. Hi, thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. And apologies to those who've heard me pontificate a bit on the subject of data before. Uh, so I'm the policy director at the National Care Forum, and we represent uh, the not-for-profit care and support sector. So our members are providers of all different sizes and shapes who are running a wide range of different types of care services, whether that's accommodation-based residential or nursing settings, supported living, supported housing, home care, uh, day services, uh, non-regulated housing, uh, supported housing more generally. You know, they do a lot of different types of things. Uh, and they have a lot of data, actually. Uh, and increasingly, they have more data. Uh, so at the National Care Forum, we've been very supportive pre-pandemic of a focus on data and digital and uh, helping our members understand the sorts of systems and technology that they need to have so that they've got data and insight at their fingertips to help them improve the quality of the care that they provide and the quality of life of the people that they're supporting. So COVID has been a real learning experience for us in terms of the interest in data. Uh, we're part of a number of research projects trying to gather different sorts of data. Uh, we're part of the DATCHA Minimum Data Set and Care Homes project. Uh, and we've always been champions, I think, of this. But we've had our fingers burned a bit. We've gone from being in the wilderness to the sunlit uplands of interest in social care data. And with that have come a whole range of challenges, which we are not really anywhere near resolving, I think, as we're in discussions with the government about their emerging strategy for health and social care data. And the fundamental problem I think we're facing is that there is not a clarity of purpose. It's not an agreed clarity of purpose of the data that we would all like to have there are, there are many interests. So there's interests in terms of national policy making. Uh, there's interest in terms of regulation from our, our lovely regulator, the Care Quality Commission. There's interest from our commissioners, uh, whether they see themselves as commissioners or just people who buy stuff from us, so they see us as contractors. Uh, there's interest from our members, our providers, in terms of understanding a better picture of the quality of care that they can provide. So those people, for example, who had electronic care planning systems uh, at the beginning of the pandemic were able to pick up very quickly that the official symptoms they were supposed to be looking for in their older, more frail residents bore no relation to the ones that they were seeing, for example. So that insight, early insight and trend data is in, immensely important in, in the quality of care. Uh, and then the area that I think we're less good at, um, and certainly from some of the Dacha study work, it, it is understanding quality of life. And so from our perspective, quality of care and quality of life are the key things, obviously. Um, but we don't, we, we don't seem to have managed to reach that consensus yet about what data is important and, and therefore how do we structure the data and, and how do we find the data. So the point that I think have been made about benefit versus burden is really key. Our members who do have um, digital systems have a huge amount of data in those systems. So potentially the question to start with is what can we easily know where we can flow data from those existing systems 
into something more central and then what do we do with that so you know data isn't free and the capacity tracker has been an immensely burdensome process and for those of you who haven't experienced the capacity tracker it's been a tool repurposed originally from um, it, its its aim of helping to improve the flow of data about vacancies to hospital discharge teams and avoid a, a weekly ring round of, of providers been repurposed to uh, a much broader scope and mission. Then there's the issue of consent and trust, which I think we've somebody mentioned. I can't remember who mentioned that. Somebody mentioned that. Um, so whose data is it? What ownership do they have over it? How much, uh, how much attention do we pay to their consent of giving it to us and sharing it? Um, how is it used in a commercial setting? At, a, at the care show last week, we were presenting findings from the Dacha study. And the immediate questions that came from the audience were, this is really valuable, hugely commercially valuable data. Where are the safeguards in the, and governance and accountability in the ownership and the use? Who's going to be selling it to whom? Uh, and given that if, for some purposes, the government regards the care sector as entirely a private commercial activity, uh, then, then they've got you know, legitimate concerns. If we look at the other side of care provision, where actually 60 or 70 percent of social care is paid for and commissioned by the state, then you could see us as a public service. So I think we kind of need to understand what characteristics we want to apply to the sector in terms of data and ownership. And some very interesting conversations within the Dacha study about how you create an environment of a trusted kind of third party data warehousing arrangement, I think, is something we could give some serious consideration to. Uh, the Health and Social Care Bill brings enormous powers for the Secretary of State. There is a single clause in that bill, which basically says the Secretary of State can require data from anybody who provides adult social care, regardless of whether it's paid for privately or by the state. Uh, and I think the examples that we see from how NHS data is collected and used probably instruct us in some ways of not doing it. So some of the performance metrics that appear to be really important in the NHS don't actually appear to relate really to the experience of people's lives and the outcomes that they would like. It seems to be much more about kind of process and, and metrics drive focus, which drives delivery. And so if you get it wrong at the beginning of that, you're going to be driving behaviors that are not in people's best interest. So then talking to our members about what they'd really like data to help them with, they would really like that data to help them to benchmark across um, similar providers, similar services, uh, other organisations who they think are like them and for whom they could reasonably compare the quality of what they do. They could compare some of their operational efficiencies um, and they could look together as a as a supportive benchmarking group to improve the way that they operate. Um, and they could also use that data to really help the journey of any of their service users, customers, people who they're supporting, whichever word you'd like, through uh, trying to navigate a health and care system that is gonna, that's already quite complicated, that's going through a massive reorganization with integrated care systems. And where there is a massive, massive opportunity to move us on in terms of um, digital expertise, digital investment, and, and access to great data about people, but might quite easily happen in, a, in 40 different, to, 40 different uh, fragmented ways. So I think there's all to play for because we're in an opportunity where everybody's interested in social care data. The risks are that we, that we do it badly <laughs> and that we don't, we don't listen to the needs and the concerns of the people who are most important in all of this, who I, I think are the people using care and support, the people providing those services, and the people who are trying to understand how to make sure that new, innovative, vibrant, nimble services are out there to meet the great unmet need that there is and to, to meet the kind of emerging expectations that our future customers are going to have. So how we respond to that. So forgive me for the bit of the rant to start with, but I do think 
the you know we've learned a lot our the data in capacity tracker is now being published as experimental statistics over which we have absolutely no control we didn't give our permission we didn't sign an arrangement we don't have an mou we just have data that's now being used and everyone's very excited about it if you're a statistician it's less exciting if it's your data and you didn't get to say so happy to be challenged happy to be inspired Yes, that's a really, really powerful intervention. Thank you very much. Um, let's go on to, to Jonathan Kilworth from Harrow Council. And a reminder to folks in, in the audience, if you do have questions that you really want to get on the board early, do put them onto the do put them into the chat window. We're keeping an eye on that. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll then get around to, to the audience after we get through our, our panelists' initial interventions. So Jonathan, welcome. Thanks very much. It's great to be here. <clears throat> so I'm Jonathan Kilworth from Harrow Council in London. I lead the adult social care bit of the business intelligence uh, service. Um, <clears throat> I'm also seconded part time to an organisation called Partners for Change, and they are uh, supporting health and social care organisations with a strength based approach um, called Three Conversations. Previously, I've worked with um, NHS Digital to build the current uh, social care data infrastructure in, in England, uh, also was the conduct of the Department of Health for a couple of years. I've worked with NICE on developing a guideline for social care and evaluating its implementation locally. Um, and I was, of course, involved uh, in Harrow with our COVID response. So the question we were asked uh, as panelists to begin with was um, uh, how we use data to define, deliver and measure better care. Now, for me, the key thing in that question, the key word in that question is use, because England is certainly not short of data. Um, that does come as a surprise to colleagues in, in other areas that we're, we're actually swimming in data. Um, we've got good uh, thinking about what is available internationally. We've got good national data sets that go into a lot of detail about what sort of care we deliver. There's a focus, a welcome focus for me on outcomes rather than on process. A lot of the old frameworks were obsessed with process. The CARE Act says that we've got to find local solutions to local problems and gives us freedom to do that. So we've moved away from prescriptions of what good looks like. Um, you know, assessments must be completed within 28 days, for example. We've moved away from that to looking at how our outcomes compare between different areas. And I think that's all good. Um, but I think one of the difficulties that that's introduced is, um, and I'm thinking here about local authority analysis, it's because we've taken away all that obsession around process. Um, it can make it difficult to work out what's leading to good or bad outcomes in your organization. Um, I would say there's probably a need to look at the skills that people in business intelligence or performance teams have and how we can build those skills. Um, around data analysis, statistics, etc. Um, so, um, social care is is a very messy business. Um, a lot of the things that determine outcomes are, are contextual, um, and it's difficult, and impossible, in fact, to, to take into account all of those. Um, one of the examples of how we're using data uh, would be around this idea of a strength-based approach to social care. So Harrow has uh, jumped on this bandwagon, like many councils, um, moving away from a tick box, um, deficit-based approach to, to assessing um, people that come and, and want social care support towards more of an enabling approach. Um, one of the ways in which um, we use data in that context is, is um, the concept of an innovation site. So an innovation site is a group, ideally, of uh, practitioners who are volunteering to be part of something different. Effectively, we're running an experiment over a limited period of time to try and do things differently. And we're, we're bringing data to that almost from the very beginning. We're looking at, for example, um, if the team's trying to work differently, how is that comparing to the sort of results they were getting before? How does it compare to other teams within the council who are working with similar clients? Um, how, does, how do we compare with other authorities in our comparator group um, in terms of direction of travel? Can we see evidence that we are moving in a different direction? Um, can we respond quickly to issues that come up 
as part of this innovation site. We're collecting feedback from people um, after our interventions to, to find out what their experience was like, feeding that back into the innovation site on a weekly basis, meeting and uh, looking at the results that are coming through. So um, we've used that, that sort of data in a very um, intensive way to try and figure out what actually works, what, what creates better outcomes, and to try to build that into business as usual. And when we do that, not to, not to leave it, but to continue monitoring it, um, as we go forwards. Um, I think it's important as a, a data person that we, we don't have any stake in whether this work succeeds or not, but that we do everything to try and help it succeed. So we've got impartiality. Um, some of the trends that I see coming and some of the sort of policy issues, we, we've got some national, um, We've got, for example, the Adult Social Care Outcomes Framework, which I think is an important, remains an important top level summary of social care um, councils, you know, did, uh, what, what, what councils achieve. That's very out of date. It needs to be replaced. There is work ongoing to do that, um, but it's been delayed. Um, similarly, there's a move to create a record level data set for adult social care activity in England. Again, that work is, it feels like it's very slow. Um, it's definitely needed. It would really enhance the 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 um, opportunity to to um, analyse and improve and what we do. But we are waiting for that to to be created. Um, it's been mentioned before about the bridge between health and social care. But you could also add housing into that or public health. Um, I don't think COVID personally has made an awful lot of difference there. I think it's still very difficult to make those links between sectors. Um, and it, we're, we're also back, moving back into the world of inspection um, with CQC having a role going forwards. Um, the worry I've got there is that we'll move back onto, uh, you know, uh, a situation where councils are very self-conscious and worried about what their data makes them look like. We, we might be going back to managing impressions, gaming indicators. Um, there might have again become a focus on process rather than outcomes. Um, my suggestion would be um, that we perhaps worry less about micromanaging how social care is delivered, but look more about how councils are using data to drive improvements. There hasn't been a sufficient focus on that in, in, in my view. Thank you. I think that's really, really useful. And um, as I think a lot to, to what's already been put on the table. Let's move on to Claire Goodman at the University, from the University of Hertfordshire. Claire, okay. welcome. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm a Professor of Healthcare Research at the University of Hertfordshire, but on this panel, because I think I've got about 15, 20 years of working with care homes, but very much with a health lens and looking at the intersection. And in November 2019, we started a project which has got 14 collaborators. It's a genuinely uh, national um, project in, uh, we're looking at how can we standardize data? How can we create a minimum data set? Um, which was a bit of a niche interest two months before um, the pandemic hit and now life has changed quite dramatically and I think you know I would echo a lot of the points that have been made so I think what I'm going to try and do is pull out some thoughts from the DACHA study itself it's um, and some of the review work we've done looking at the international learning around what happens when you standardize data to work across health and social care um, and what I think good might look like. Um, I was amused by Liz's comment about trying to get some agreement as to what they, the data should even be. And even within our team, we have had to take a step back and say, okay, what do we think a minimum data set is? And Jenny um, Burton from Glasgow and Arna Voltis from the Health Foundation have it should be hot off the press soon. We have a draft discussion paper where we actually had to set out our own stall and say, okay, this is what we think, because we realized we, if we, if we didn't really nail that, we were going to get stuck in very minute arguments about what data should or shouldn't be able to do. 
Um, but I think in terms of what does good look like, I think you know it's working when it is the basis for every conversation. And certainly when we looked at the minimum data set um, literature from North America, it can just be an administrative task. It can be just what Jonathan was saying. It can be used to prove um, that you're doing what you ought to do in a defensive way. Or there were examples in the literature of where it became the starting point for the conversation, that it created uh, a sense of consensus. And that really was reflected in how it was introduced, the level of investment and training that was put in to the long-term care infrastructure. Um, and that also links to data literacy, which I think Owen raised. And what we found was it wasn't just about, if you like, a slightly stereotyped view that this is a workforce who will be um, sort of technologically shy. The evidence doesn't suggest that, but what it does show is that it really important that data entry and data capture in care homes isn't seen as something that isn't care work. So if it was seen as something other, then it became an admin task, it seemed to be what the issue was. Um, and so in terms of what would good outcomes look like, it would really, it's when it fostered trust and relationships and parties felt they were getting feedback that was then acted on. And that sort of virtuous circle, and I'm sure that plays out in the innovation um, that Jonathan was describing. And we can learn a lot from the capacity tracker because there has been so many unintended consequences of where good um, relationships established between local authority and independent providers have actually been harmed by the centralizing of data capture and relationships dismantled. Um, and then just finally, because so much has already been said, is um, I think there is an issue which DATCHA is not tackling, but we are wondering whether we should be, is the data from domiciliary care, so housing and um, care that's delivered to people in their own homes, because these people are on a very recognizable pathway. If you need home care, then you possibly are going to need long-term care at some point, or are gonna need hospital care. So linking that data capture as well. And I'd just like to comment on Barbara Hanratty's national survey um, of the data that care homes already capture, and it is phenomenal. Um, and and they are a significant percentage are using standardized assessment measures already. So the um, but the question is we know very little about how they're using those measures and where they get fed through to and what are used more frequently or even the timing. So even distinguishing, okay, this is a measure we would want annually, this is something we would want to have access to every six months and so on. Those kind of conversations are really where you get very granular. And there is, uh, there, I'm sure everybody here would understand the ethics of creating extra work and duplication. So that's, if you like, the starting point that nobody is agreeing with. Um, but I think, there is also an issue is that nobody wants to say it's okay we don't need that data so we have been doing a lot of national stakeholder consultations and every single one we've said okay well what data don't you really need you collect but nobody's really using it and nobody is willing to let go of the data they've got which is going to be a problem because we are, we're trying to generate a minimum data set um, and and so one of the things we're wrestling when in the DATCHA uh, study is our criteria for the very painful process of saying, no, we are not going to record that for the minimum data set. You can record it for other purposes, but not for the MDS. Thank you. Claire, thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to move on to Caroline Jones from the Office for Statistics um, Regulation. Uh, Caroline, thank thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. So my name is Caroline Joan. Um, so what might help a little bit when, when I tell you about what we do is for you to take a step back and think, um, think about how national commentators and legislators get balanced information. Um, and these sort of groups I'm thinking about are mainstream media, 
MPs and other um, assembly members, think tanks such as, as Charles represents here, charities and lobby groups. So the information, the statistics that they use come from publicly commissioned and published free statistics um, at a national level. So my job is to ensure that those data and statistics uphold professional standards and are um, produced in a trustworthy way. So I don't actually have hand-to-hand um, -hand sort of combat with statistics and data, um, but we do try and ensure that the data that you're, you're using um, from a national standpoint um, is the best it can be. So I work for the Office for Statistics Regulation um, we're a very new body, maybe um, less than 10 years old. Um, we're a regulatory arm of the UK Statistics Authority. And our job is to promote and safeguard the production and publication of official statistics. Now, legally, these are statistics produced by government crown bodies that are named on an official statistics order. So it's quite a small proportion of the total data available. Um, however, we have the vision that the, the government statistics should serve the public good. And this is a very broad, um, broad vision statement. So we are responsible for devising and publishing what we call a code of practice for statistics. And it's a professional handbook for the government statisticians. Increasingly, um, other organizations who are not part of the government um, are also picking up and voluntarily applying the code of practice because it, it's actually, we think it's very good. Um, so what we do with that is to ensure trustworthiness of the data, um, the quality and the value of the data ultimately, things that we've actually touched on a little bit already today. So specifically about social care, so from 2018, we were um, doing a study of Great Britain's uh, social care statistics, and we published a series of reports very early in 2020, before the pandemic. Um, and we felt there were a lot of strategic and operational issues for, um, for improvement um, within Great Britain. And then obviously, unfortunately, the pandemic came, and as you say, um, social care was was caught up in this, this um, tragedy and there wasn't enough data really to understand what was happening. So in 2021, so round about um, July time, we decided we wanted to look at what action had been taken with adult social care statistics since the 18 months that we published the reports. And so we spoke to producers of statistics and viewed the statistics as they were coming out. And we're going to um, publish a report on what we found probably December, um, certainly before Christmas. Um, what we did find, just briefly, you probably already know, so emergency measures were introduced to manage the spread of coronavirus. And a lot of the business as usual statistics had been de-scoped, delayed or suspended because um, pragmatic decisions had to be taken about reducing the burden on data suppliers, so local authorities and NHS um, providers of care, as well as obviously the care homes. So um, what, we, what we feel is um, a lot of what you said already, so a lot of it's been covered, um, but there's a little bit more energy and focus that are being applied to develop the statistics. I think now we're trying to come out of the pandemic. So what you'll find in the report is that there's still a lot of outstanding actions for producers that you kind of touched on already today. Um, but there's a little bit more um, hope for change, I think. So that's where I'll, I'll stop there. Karen, if that's okay. Caroline, that's great. Thanks. Okay, our final our final panelist, um, Charles Talk uh, from the Health Foundation. Welcome. Hello. Um, yeah, so it's been incredibly interesting just hearing the variety of perspectives on this. 
Um, so I'm going to try desperately hard to bring a slightly different perspective, or well, maybe not a slightly different perspective, but um, to say something a bit different. So just a bit about my background. So I was chief analyst of the Dilnot Commission back in 2010-11. I was head of social care funding reform at the Department of Health, um, head of analysis for social care. Um, and now I'm at the Health Foundation. And over the last, um, since I've been here, which is a couple of years, I've been working quite a bit on social care policy. Um, and obviously one of the things which comes out quite strongly from what people have said is that, you know, there is different data is needed by different parties. There are so many different perspectives and, and angles on this. There's, you know, data for service users and their families. So, you know, we've got a system which is based basically on choice. You know, it's not like, um, well, obviously there are aspects of the NHS in which we've got choice, but in social care, if you are a self-funder, you're basically left on your own to choose. You need data to, to support those choices. You need data on, ideally on kind of outcomes from the kind of care you're gonna get. You certainly need data on um, the costs you might face. Um, obviously there are, you know, people who are providing care, care providers, they need obviously data to help coordinate care. Um, they, need, they need data on the people they're caring for based on their kind of history. Obviously regulators need data, commissioners, local authority commissioners of care need data. But the two aspects I'm gonna really talk about, I think are one that Caroline mentioned, which is data to inform public debate and hold decision makers and others in the system to account. Um, and then data for policy makers, for policy analysts and kind of policy researchers. So I'm gonna really talk about those two perspectives. I'm gonna talk as a, someone who was a policymaker in, and I have to say, it's, here's an English perspective, I'm sorry. Um, a, a perspective of a policymaker in England um, as a policy analyst, but also my role in the Health Foundation is someone who's trying to improve the quality of public debate around this to shed a light on some of the, the kind of issues and provide evidence for policymaking. So the first thing I would say is that my time in um, working in government as a policymaker and also working then in the Health Foundation 10 years later, I think it's quite frustrating being a, a kind of policy analyst because the data is pretty thin available to, for national decision makers. And I kind of do sometimes wonder whether that's part of the reason why social care is fared much worse than health. There's just much le less data. There's less data told people to count and there's less there's data for um, people who are making policy to convince, for example, the treasury to, you know, to um, provide money for social care. Um, I think it's, always useful, as Liz was saying, to kind of start with what the questions are. So, you know, are the, some of the questions I think as a national policymaker are, you know, what is the need, what, what are the needs of the population for social care? Um, that's not an even, even an easy answer, question to answer. What's the level of unmet needs? How have they changed? Um, you know, what is, we know that spending per person adjusting for age has fallen by about 12% in real terms since 2010. What are the consequences of that for individuals and for their families? Second set of questions are around like, what's the performance of the system of, as a whole? For the NHS, we have um, really good data on things like waiting times, the kind of 18 weeks, A&E performance. There's kind of very little comparable in social care, but like it just doesn't make the headlines in the same way because we don't have, we don't have 5.5 5 million people waiting on the front pages. Um, the, we've got the out, adult social care outcomes framework, which is, I guess, trying to tell us something about the um, outcomes of social care from an individual's perspective. But that's quite, that's really only for people who get, who've actually received local authority care. It doesn't cover people who don't, but might still have social care needs. And it certainly doesn't cover people who are, um, are getting privately funding their care. Um, Another set of questions about how people get their care needs met. For example, you know, what care do people who have difficulty with two activities of daily living receive in different parts of the country? How does that compare? Um, obviously, a big question for the Dilnot Commission was around, in particular, looking at the people who are outside the local authority funded system. You know, how much do people spend on care? Not just at a point in time, but what are the kind of, uh, from the age of 65, looking across the kind of your the kind of care you will receive over the rest of your life. 
you know, what, what does that look like and how much might you spend? The Dilmont Commission identified um, as a key issue what the risks, the, the kind of risks faced at the age of 65 and the fact that, you know, some people had very, needed very little and spent very little on social care. Other people spent huge amounts. That's a key insight, but it was really, really difficult to get that insight. In fact, it was derived mainly from data um, from a particular care provider on the length of stay in residential care. It was really, really hard to build it up from domiciliary care. Um, I think there's a massive gap, and I've, I, I think this is, I'm recently looking at this, it's still a gap on the care received by people who are not older, but of working age. It's very, very hard as a think tank to, to write much about this. We know there are huge issues for people who are working age adults, and but it's it's very little to know, very difficult to know much beneath some kind of quite, quite sort of big headlines. Um, what would care to I've touched on this? What care do people get in their own homes? Obviously, people in care homes are a kind of like they are a defined institutionalized population. We can get that data. It's very, very hard to get um, data for domiciliary care. The new ONS data, which you mentioned, Kian, on, um, that was put, um, released on Friday, was fantastic about residential care, but there is it highlights the gap there is on with home care. And then what are the outcomes from care? What is the value for money for different types of care? So, you know, off, you do hear some people talking about, you know, we should, you know, we should be moving from, from residential to home care. There's presumably some limit at which, um, you know, that shift um, is not, cost effective I don't think we know necessarily about what is I'm not saying no one knows but as I'm talking again from a national policy maker point of view what is the right kind of level if there is such a thing so what's the right mix of care I think just the biggest gaps for me would be on care which is self-funded this the system we have in England is one in which we basically at the moment have got local authority supported residents and self-funders as government, I think it's this is a this is the system over which government um, presides, and therefore it's really really important. We can't pretend those people who are outside local authority funded care aren't part of the system. They are. They're just part of a, of a system in which users pay for themselves. Um, as I mentioned, data on working age adults I think is really really lacking, and then data on quality and outcomes. Um, I think that's that's another one, and. Overall, across those longitudinal data, not just cross-sectional, because these are people as they go through their lives are on a, a, a kind of, they get care across their lifetimes. It's really important to understand that whole care journey and how it changes. So I'm just gonna add on, just on two kind of, I guess, positive notes. Firstly, there is clearly a lot of good admin data out there. Like there's so much data collected by local authorities, by care providers. Um, it seems to me that being able to kind of harness and use that data um, presents a real opportunity. The announced reforms for a cap on care costs, obviously that will create some more um, um, work for local authorities to do in terms of um, understanding how much people are spending. The flip side of that is we are creating a more universal system everyone will be part of this because if you want to have your care costs met when you hit the cap, you will need to come to go to your local authority, you will have to have your care needs assessed. That actually provides a system in which we've got data on a far greater number of people. Um, so potentially gives us a much better view of the system as a whole. Um, and I would say that although sometimes I'm, I kind of look at it, look at the situation and think, the data we have now is not that much better from a national policy making perspective as it was 10 years ago. There is the debate around this is so much greater now. There's a much under, greater understanding of what the shortcomings are and a much greater understanding of what the opportunities are. Charles, thank you for that really lively and um, to uh, that round trip around and the panel. And I mean, clearly some some big themes were emerging there, but there was also some divergence, which is always useful to, to see uh, on a panel. I want to I now open it up to the, the 40 something people we have in, in our audience. Um, if you've got a question, stick your hand up um, using the, the reaction tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, 
ask your question uh, in the box, whatever whatever it takes to, to get our attention. I'd also ask, uh, obviously, the panelists as well, if you want to come back in and, and, and respond to any of those things. I know, I think Adelina has a question to, to lead us off. So Adelina, maybe I'll go to you first, but would encourage others to to um, start thinking. I see some hands already, great stuff. Okay, Adelina, why don't you start us off? Thank you, and thanks for these amazing, uh, these thoughtful and considered uh, contributions. And uh, building a bit and feeding on from what, uh, what was said, I think a, a reaction from me having been looking at, the, at how the evidence was emerging and the experiences of all the different countries when dealing with the pandemic, one clear problem was the lack of having a means to identify people who were relying on care, but also providing care in the context of an emergency. And I think uh, this was a, a very stark reminder of, of the very uh, uh, little infrastructure that we have in terms of data in this sector and the fact that large amounts of people who are self-funders and paid carers we don't really know how to reach them, but even people in care homes were difficult to identify and to, to, to know how to make sure that they were able to get the resources. So uh, from a sort of emergency preparedness uh, lens, I just want you to emphasize the importance of being able to identify the people that we want to make sure we support in, a, in another emergency, maybe a pandemic, but it could have been the fuel shortages had things got worse. So how do we make sure that carers and not just professional cares, but also unpaid carers who care for others have uh, are, are identified in the context of an emergency? How do we make sure, for example, that we can really identify them, uh, them for maybe vaccination, maybe for PPE, for communications, for making sure that they can access the guidance that is produced, especially when they're not covered by the system. And I was, I mean, I had a note, but actually Charles just said it, uh, on whether the new social uh, care cap introduction will enable us to, to have a better infrastructure to do that. And I wanted to emphasize the importance of making sure that the unpaid carers are also included in this discussion about the data infrastructure. That was a Great panel, and thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Adelina. Do, do any of the panelists want to want to take that straight off? And and I, I particularly note that the question there on, on the levy, which will obviously apply very differently in the different jurisdictions, um, or the implications are different in the different jurisdictions. Does anybody want to give a reaction on that? On the on the kind of on the politics of that and the implications? Is well, I mean, from a from a pro provider perspective in terms of ability for the system to support us in delivering services to those people, then absolutely uh, being able to understand what services are in place and who is using them um, is kind of fundamental. And, um, uh, you know, what, I guess, what, what the pan what, what the response in the pandemic offered was the opportunity for the whole system to come together to support uh, providers who were really up against it. I mean, really up against it. And what we saw was some areas really responsive to that, and other areas really not. But they, uh, in terms of trying to gather emergency data, they all had access to the same emergency data. So I guess there's something about not not trying to do it in an emergency, being a bit more prepared, um, and uh, trying to understand the flow of people around the system. I mean, I'm struck by Charles talking about people of working age and the information that we didn't have about them because actually, lots of the lobbying about um, pandemic support for those groups of people and the services that were supporting them. You know, sort of fell on deaf ears for a while. So, from a uh, so from a lobbying point of view, I I really think that we that data is is critical. I guess there's a kind of organisational challenge, isn't there, in in terms of how you keep up to date with kind of real live picture of of people, um, and some of that data matching work that's happening in the Dacha study might well give us some insights because. I know the Health Foundation are looking at what do we already actually routinely know about people in routine data sets. We just can't match it to people. 
So it might be that if the clever people who are doing that work can help us understand how we kind of see people around the system, how we can identify people around the system, that might help even more, if you see what I mean, than just knowing where they are at any one time. That flow, I think, is really important. Um, I guess it comes back to as well the effort versus the benefit, doesn't it? It's of immense benefit to policymakers to know some of this stuff, but it's only of immense benefit to us if people help us with it. Um, and we can use that data to improve access for people. You know, I was looking to try and find some data from the NHS to highlight the fact that we have got people unable to leave hospital because we haven't got enough staff to look after them in social care services. And I was horrified to find that the delayed transfer of care data as publication was paused in the pandemic. So at the same time, the capacity tracker was built, well, repurposed and loads of questions added to it. The thing that would really help us understand the impact on the system and everyone only listens to the NHS impact is the bit of data that I can't get because it's not being published anymore. So, uh, so that a kind of understanding how the system is working for people is really important as part of that pandemic or, or any kind of future, I guess, future pressures, crisis. So, yeah, if we can, and it's easy, let's try and find an easy way, she says naively, an easy way to do it. Thanks, Liz. And I, and I, I think you have hinted at one of the reasons we were interested in doing this session today, which isn't just to say what, what, what should that data be, but who's making the decisions about the data and data infrastructure? And how do we go about making those decisions uh, in, in better ways? Um, OK, I see a couple of questions. Do any other, any other panelists want to come back on that immediately? Maybe I'll... somebody flashed. Jonathan, yeah, great. I was hoping you'd come in on, on that. And then we'll uh, go to Simon and Chris. Well, just from a local authority point of view, I think the, the point about the delayed transfers um, information stopping is really interesting. I mean, there's been a huge knock on effect on councils in social care from the discharge to assess arrangement. So people are coming out of hospital much faster, but they're also coming out much more unwell. And although there's health funding to cover uh, the costs of care for a few weeks after discharge, um, that's putting an enormous strain on councils to do all of that assessing work essentially about what people's long-term needs are going to be and how we best help them achieve the most independence that, that, they, that they can. Um, that, that pressure, I don't know that, that that's very visible nationally. Uh, it looks good from the hospital's point of view that capacity has been freed up, but I'm not sure it's appreciated just what of a knock-on effect that has. We've got people, you know, who are placed in residential care following discharge who would not normally have gone to residential care from hospital. We've got people with very large packages of care that would not have had such a large package of care. If we don't get in there and assess them quickly and support them, there's a risk that they've actually become used to that and, you know, they become more dependent on support than they otherwise would have been. And I don't know that that's visible in national data. Thanks, Jonathan. Simon, uh, you've had your hand up a while. I'm going to take you and then we'll take Chris back to back and, and see where we get to then. Yeah, thanks very much. So this is a subject that's been uh, near to my heart for, for quite a while. So a couple of quick points and a sort of question, if, if, that's, uh, if that's helpful for you. Um, the, the first quick point was about um, uh, qualitative data. I think one of the things that we've learned at King's Fund over time is that it's not just about the numbers, but about collecting people's stories. And you can actually gain a lot more insight um, from uh, or as much insight from those stories uh, and those experiences as you can from the sort of from the data points so not to lose that so for example the the, uh, the data that um, Health Watch England collects with its enter and views it, it's always struck me as odd in many ways that those aren't linked very clearly to the um, to the formal inspections that CQC is carrying out given that they're actually part of the same organization so qualitative data as well as as, as Quan. Um, the second thing was about use of data, which I think probably picks up Charles's point. Um, 
So one of the things we, we've done now for three years is to do a publication called Social Care 360, which takes uh, a small number of indicators which are published and readily available and tracks the trends in them over, over time. Um, but one of the things that's always struck me, and I've lived that data for quite a while and I've gone out and presented it, is how often what to me seem really obvious things, really basic trends that are there to be seen, simply aren't known even well within the sector. And if they are known, they're not necessarily cared about. Uh, so the one I always use as an example is um, is, uh, is direct payments, uh, which were a sort of key feature of the 2014 uh, Care Act, a, a key indicator of quality of care. They're part of the ASCOF framework. And yet, actually, when you look at the trend, which was broadly that uh, they've been falling for a number of years and have essentially plateaued, people are often very surprised about that and if they but even if they are surprised they don't care very much and there's no interest in that from DHS, DHSC nationally it's just not something an indicator that they're interested in so if you've got something that really matters or should really matter you know then someone's got to do something uh, with that I think uh, and then the third thing just very briefly was was the, the key bits of data that I think could genuinely add value. I, I was part of a project, oh, this is six or seven years ago, led by NHS England, which was looking at a national minimum data set for care homes. Uh, and they were looking at it from a, from, an, from a health perspective. And one of the things that came through really clearly was an understanding of uh, the incidence of pressure uh, ulcers, pressure sores amongst care home uh, residents, because it's a real smoking gun for a bad care home, I think. No, not in all cases, but very often, if people are developing pressure ulcers, pressure sores within a care home, that's something that you really want to know about because it, it's something very wrong uh, about it. Um, but that data isn't routinely collected, even by uh, CQC. So the question that linked to that is, what are you know if, if the panelists had one piece of data that isn't publicly available that they'd like to be publicly available because they think it would be make a difference what would that piece of data be okay thanks and th thanks for the the, the, the comments Simon. they're really useful i'm going to let the panelists think about that question for a minute and chris let's hear from you Okay, thank you. Um, I mainly work with people with learning disabilities, so I was very st struck with um, Charles's comments about mm. people of working age. Um, and I guess there's some issues that I think pre present even greater challenges to social care data than the ones we've talked about. One is that for adults with learning disabilities, there's no way to identify the population that's independent of eligibility for social care or health care. So we don't know the total population of adults with learning disabilities who may be needing social care but aren't getting it. Um, I, so I think the second thing relates to Simon's point actually about direct payments. And that I, I think there's a real challenge for people with learning disabilities and other groups in thinking about social care, care data in terms of identifying a service that people are using. So first of all, most people aren't in care homes, most people with learning disabilities, and they're not in social care systems that are kind of readily identifiable. So supporting living to a certain extent, support at home, using personal assistance. Um, but there are also, I think, even greater challenges than that in that there are people getting short term or intermittent or low level social care support. Um, I think there are going to be increasing blurring of boundaries with things like strengths based approaches, social prescribing. So when is some kind of support social care or not? And I think also Simon's point about direct payments is quite fundamental because if somebody's getting a personal budget and they are able to exercise um, control over that, then they may not be buying a service at all. They might not be using that to fund all sorts of things which are supporting them in their daily lives, but there aren't social care services. How do we capture that? And I think just one other quick point about data, I guess, is that um, I think a lot of people are going to be quite wary about data. I think prepayment cards um, for personal budgets are a real kind of cautionary tale about that. Or actually lots of people who are getting prepayment cards supposedly for their personal budget. Actually, they're used for quite um, controlling um, surveillance and control purposes over things which shouldn't necessarily be controlled. So I think while we're always thinking of you know, more, not necessarily more is better, but, you know, but kind of more is better and using uh, administrative data systems. I think there might be 
a price in terms of kind of ethics and trust. Chris, really interesting stuff. And, and that issue, I guess, of uh, broader conversations about public benefits of, of um, public data, which is, which is all, often commercial or coming from commercial service, but nevertheless of, as, as public interest aspects, is something that's, that's coming out here in, in quite an interesting way. I want, let's let's go back then to the panel and 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 that question from Simon maybe about you know what is the one or two pieces of data you'd really like to see on the board here and remember this is I, I think this is doubly important because there are going to be consultations coming out there's there's people working across uh, 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 across the sector and uh, uh, I guess across the academic academic system at the moment perhaps we have opportunities to get some of this stuff on the table. So it's anybody, Jonathan, I see your hand up straight away. Anybody else who'd like to, from the panel first, who'd like to come back on, on, on that or any of the other points raised? Jonathan. Okay, so uh, I couldn't resist because talking about ask off indicators and direct payments, which is something I've also thought a lot about. I mean, one of the things I said at the, in my intro was that, that there is lots of data collected. One of the things that we collect is of course all the social care survey results and they're published and you can look at an individual level actually you could look at how own you could see how people responded to the to the social care survey these are people who are in receipt of long-term support there is a gap for people who aren't receiving that that uh, that that type of support but there's there are indicators on control over daily life and direct payments we're told are a way of boosting people's level of control over daily life. But when I did an analysis to look at nationally in England, the correlation between the levels of direct payments among councils and the level of control that the population was reporting, there was no correlation at all. They are not linked. So it seemed like it wasn't necessarily the case that more direct payments means more choice and control for people. When we did a local analysis, we found that there were some groups that were benefiting but others were actually made things worse because of the administrative burden of managing a direct payment. So it's very difficult to come up with, you know, generalized decisions that you should do more of this. Difficult for Department of Health to manage that and say councils should have higher levels of direct payments when it doesn't affect or, or benefit people equally. And just quickly on what Simon said about qualitative data, totally agree that you can't run, for example, an innovation site on strength-based practice without getting the views of people who have been through that. When we did a, a presentation recently on some of the financial benefits we'd found of a strength-based approach, um, one of the uh, people on our group who, who is a service user said, well, what about the experience of people? It's only when you can show that what you've done isn't having a negative impact and hopefully it's having a positive impact that you can justify, um, you know, saving money. Thanks, Jonathan. Owen, your hand is up. And... Yeah, thanks, Ian. Um, to respond to, to Chris, Chris's question about what data or pieces of data would you, you know, be on the top of your list, uh, are my responses possibly going to sound a little glib maybe, but I don't want data. I want answers. Data is just an ingredient that we use to get to the answer. Um, and I think there's a, a, you know, this almighty race to gather more and more data without actually thinking about the question that we want to answer in the first place. Um, I think that's sometimes kind of problematic, especially when we go back to some of the other comments that were um, made earlier about, you know, needing to know what it is you're collecting data for or not collecting data for, you know, the, the sake of collecting data and then never using it uh, to, to kind of just in case uh, thing. Oh, and also um, Simon mentioned about quality, quality of data and yeah, I couldn't agree more. When I was in West Government, we set up the performance improvement framework um, the the research that we did prior to writing that uh, suggested that the, there isn't a right way to do it. There are many different ways to do it, and they work best when used in combination. And there are some things that using quality, quantitative analysis, sorry, are just not suitable for. Um, so we kind of built that into 
to the to, to the new way of working. So yeah, definitely qualitative information and the use of you know already existing research and evidence is is you know vital in in promoting and better understanding really. Thanks, Owen. Jenny. Okay, so I'm going to, I guess, take a liberty as well that since I want to work with Liz, I'll have Liz's measure of uh, a quality of life measure. But I think that one of the things that's really been lacking is the ability to compare and understand the people um, in receipt of care. So a measure that, that captures the complexity and dependency of those in receipt of care. Because I think one of the big problems with the pandemic has been this, this treating of either care homes or care at home as if they are identical with identical populations um, and that all other things are even. Um, and I think that one of the reasons for that um, and the challenge with that is that we've also seen a really unprecedented release of data during the pandemic about people living in care homes and about the care homes that they live. Um, and I think this picks up on the, the question that was raised about sort of security and privacy and how people are going to or not be willing to share their data. Um, and I guess it's just to highlight that freedom of information legislation has been used by a number of journalists throughout the pandemic to sort of relentlessly ask for different bits of the jigsaw um, and publish information about essentially where people live um, with actually minimal statistical disclosure control. So Public Health Scotland have just been through the process by which a count of less than 10 for where individuals were discharged to was challenged and upheld by the Information Commissioner in Scotland, such that data have been published at the less than five count. So for those who've been working with linked data, with national data, with kind of sensitive information, Certainly, I find this absolutely shocking in terms of the release of information um, about essentially where people live at a very identifiable small geographical level. And I do think that sort of this question of freedom of information, this question of public interest that isn't just pandemic specific, but runs the risk of sort of setting precedents for care homes. At the moment, if I was a care home, I would be looking very carefully at the information that I was going to share about my service on my residence, because as Liz has said, it's been used on multiple occasions in ways that were not those that were defined and that in some ways go against the kind of purposes and the, the existing processes around routine data and data linkage. And so I think it, it's a point for the OSR and others about just to think about how do we make sure as we move out of pandemic and out of emergency response, we also recalibrate whose rights we're protecting. So in all of these requests, we've got a BBC Lake table of who died in which care home with no contextual data at all, other than whether it's a private provider or not, made for some headlines, but it hasn't helped support any of those people in those care homes. And I would question whether it's supported any of the families who've lost loved ones to COVID to understand anything more about the problem. And the hospital discharge data in Scotland have been the same. It doesn't help you to understand something when you release longitudinal data as a cross section without context under I, um, FOI rules. And I think we need to really get that into the discussion and debate because I, I still find it very shocking that this is where we are. A lot of nodding heads there and thumbs up, Jenny, and a really powerful example of why context around data counts. Thanks. Charles, you wanted to come in. Yeah, quite short, really. Um, so I think I reckon if you could put, so I'm taking, I'm banking the um, Liz's, Liz's life out, quality of life outcomes. And I'm thinking if you could put that together with data on individuals' needs assessed via, you know, a multidimensional tool and the services they're getting, that would be amazing. It would actually help answer a lot of really big questions. And very importantly, it would actually give social care better data than the NHS has, because actually for most care, the NHS does not have anything on outcomes. It's got proms for a very few things. If we could do that, we would then be leapfrogging what the NHS can do. And that would make me very happy. Alina. Just a reminder, we don't want to leave out the people who don't receive any services and might benefit from them, or carers would benefit from support. And again, really 
emphasizing and of bringing that up again, the importance of making sure that we also understand, and, and perhaps here we will need to, to rely on primary care data from, from uh, GPs or an understanding about the and finding these people who are relying exclusively on unpaid care and the, the situation of these unpaid carers and how that may change under different contexts. And I think here there are very limited avenues to find these people, but I'd say that I'd really like to emphasize the potential role of GPs and primary care of helping us um, identify and perhaps support better this population. Another call out to the audience. Any other questions from the audience? Anything come to mind? I want to. I want to reflect on Simon. I thought you, you you made an interesting point about qualitative data and stories, and and something I said at the start was that I wanted to, to to at least flag across people here was was policy and politics, right? And how we achieve say political change, policy change. Stories are really important there. Um, you know, and, and building legitimacy behind stories. So I guess I want to ask panelists and any, anybody else, is this about, you know, is, is, is building the, 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 the capabilities, the skills, the infrastructures, the institutions that we've talked about in, in, in terms of data for social care, is this now about senior policy folks getting data? Or is there something else there? What's, what, what's the core drivers for, for change and, and bringing about some of the stuff that, that, that particularly say Jenny and, and Charles and, and Chris Hatton have talked about there over the last couple of uh, interventions? What is that key driver? What's gonna get some of these things over the line? Um, is, is kind of maybe my, as we've got five minutes left, my kind of you know final prompt to you. As you're thinking about that, Liz, you've got your hand up. Um, yeah, well, I was going to respond to the stories bit. I really agree with that. The only trouble is every time we talk about that to the DHSC, they tell me that stories don't convince the Treasury. Um, and basically quite a lot of what we're trying to do is convince the Treasury. So I think we need both, kind of both and. Um, in terms of, of the opportunity, you know, we have got a set of ministers who are clearly very keen to understand data, um, probably more so now actually as they're thinking about reform than perhaps they were during the pandemic i don't know maybe but um uh, and and there is a you know they come with a political particular ideology i think so um let's see what we can do to respond to some of that ideology harness it for uh the things that we really want to be able to do the data that we want to be able to have um and let's try and talk let's Let's try to talk to the people who are going to have to be providing the data, whether it's people who are running care services, people using care services, um, people who'd like to use care services but can't get to them, the unmet need people, uh, and the people who currently create systems to gather data. You know, there is, we are so much further forward than we were a few years ago. And there is such a lot of data out there. I agree with, uh, is it Jonathan from Harrow, that there's a vast array of data. Uh, we could do something quickly around data standards and data consistency. Um, we could look at, at understanding how to do quick wins. You know, what can we have now? What can we easily know now? And then what might we want to know? And what do we really not want to know? And what do we all gather that no one's interested in? So we could just stop, really. Um, so I think there's all to play for, but I, I don't, I think the conversation at the top of the political office is probably not about data, it's about purpose of data, ease of collecting data, and who's prepared to pay for data, because data's never free. Excellent, thanks Liz. Does anybody else want to add, to add to that or come back on, on any of those points? Jonathan. I think Liz, Liz is, um, I agree totally with Liz. I thought she was, said that beautifully. Because um, I think you, you definitely, so often the reason is that these things don't get pushed, I think, is that the benefits of it flow to the next generation of people. You know, it takes a while to set things up. Therefore, certainly within government, I think people often focus on the shorter term 
this requires a, a longer term view. Um, I think therefore focusing on those things where there are, you know, try, trying to make use of what is already there, not creating some new massive, you know, costly data collection, which I know, I know none of us are probably talking about, but kind of using that to, and the quick wins, I really like that idea, you know, are there some things which can really demonstrate this? And there will be bit data here which can unlock certain things, I think, like unlock certain um, questions, really. So and those, I think that focusing on those would be the most useful thing. Thanks, Charles. Let's go, Jonathan. And then Jenny had her hand up. It's gone down again. But let's let's go to Jonathan uh, in the 90 seconds we have left with giving Jenny a bit yeah. of time to Jonathan. I totally, totally agree about the gap for people that are self-funding carers that are not on the local authority radar. How do we collect data from those people and who will pay for that? That's a really, really good question and challenge. Um, I don't think we can do either at the moment. But that that is such an important area, a dark area of the, the, the social care landscape that we, we really don't know much about. Thanks, Jonathan. Jenny? Yeah, I guess it's just my advocacy would be that the quick wins come from the sector and the people using care and not from, from the top, because uh, there's a real risk that NHS questions will dominate. So how many people have an unscheduled attendance at hospital, your care home's worse than this care home? Nobody understands what that means. Nobody helps anyone. Nobody moves the conversation forward. So yes, absolutely, let's use the data and showcase the potential, but be prepared to work on really important questions as derived by the people they're really important to, not necessarily what, what other systems and bits of the system think are important. Thanks, Jenny. I think that's a perfect final comment in terms of where the decision should, decision making should be driven from and some of these political changes certainly lines up with maybe my perspectives. Thank you very much to all the panellists who have cleared their diaries uh, and, and all the participants and, and, and everybody in the audience has cleared your diaries to be here today. Um, we could talk for another hour and a half on this and I'm, I'm sure we will in various different guises. Adelina and the folks at LTC COVID also, thank you. We're going to continue with the, the, the UK Ethics Accelerator to, to, to work on this. Um, and, and many of you will continue to hear from me and our, and our colleagues at the International Panel uh, of Policy Observatory uh, at UCL, Mike Hurden and Jeff Mulgan there, who we're also working with. I think that's it. Unless Adelina, you have anything else to, to say, um, that's it for me just to say we'll probably be discussing this in an international context at some point on the 6th of December I put the details on the chat earlier I think I've got them here in case anybody is joined now and wants to find out about this event and that was fantastic thank you very much we'll be sharing the recording in the next week or so and we'll try and uh, send you a message through the event right uh, to all of those who were here. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very, very insightful and uh, important uh, debate. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye.